Wilson. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was a modest round of applause. I hope I'll get a bigger one at the end. Uh, my name is Ken Wilson. It's working. It's working. I'm okay. And my talk is called Is Improvisation Good for Students? So let's do something practical, shall we? Can you all please stand up? Hooray! Creaking knees. That was very good. You stand up very well. You're very good at standing up. No, I believe in telling students when they do something well. Okay, and if you're not the best students in the class and you stand up when I say stand up, I say well done. Congratulations. You've done very well. Ah, oh, there's people moving around. It's like a like an underground station. Okay. Now this is a serious. All my activities are quite serious. They sometimes come out as funny. So at the end, I'll try and tell you what the serious point is. But the first thing now is, can you please choose an age between 14 and 18? For the next five minutes, you're going to be a teenager. So choose a new age for yourself. How old are you? 17. How old are you? 18. Okay, how old are you? 14. 14. Well, you're in the class of the big girls, so that's good. Okay, now can you please choose a new nationality for yourself, okay? Choose a different nationality from your own nationality. Have you all done that? Now, I'm very short-sighted and really deaf, so I have to have a bit of a loud response if I ask you a question. Have you all done that? Yes. Now, can you choose a name to go with your new nationality? It doesn't have to be common from that nationality. It can be an unusual name. You can be Juan from Japan. It's not a problem. Okay? So, so when I come around, you can tell me my name is, I come from, and I'm years old. Okay? So let's find out who you all are. Who are you? I'm Tasha, from Turkey, and Excellent. Who are you? That's not, you're really, 13? You're in the wrong class. <laughs> you're now not. You sound so typically German then that I can't get that right. Very well. I'm rich. And you're really not Italian. Uh, that was very good. You know, I mean, you don't have to act in the accent. <laughs> that was fantastic. That's really very good. This is amazing. You're all putting on great accents as well. That's very, very impressive. Um, okay, now that's great. Now what I didn't tell you is that also, you are the best in your country at a particular sport. So can you please choose the sport? You do not have to demonstrate the sport, I promise. Okay, now this is a serious, serious point. Now you must trust me in these things. But I want you to choose a sport that you're very good at, okay? So now you can say, my name is, I come from, I'm years old and I'm very good at aiming, okay? So have you chosen your sport? Have you chosen your sport? Yes. yes. Okay, okay, let's find out. Uh, I am Casimir, I'm 14 years old, I come from France, and I am very good at skiing. Skiing? <laughs> Excellent skiing. Is skiing an Olympics? I should have said an Olympic sport. Yeah, 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 skiing's yeah, fine. Skiing's yeah, fine. Yeah, okay, the winter Olympics, of course, yeah. Uh, Tatiana, Czech Republic, I'm 16, I'm the best in hockey. Excellent, okay. What about you, sir? Pardon? <laughs> Now, is he he's acting now? <laughs> uh, I'm Francois, I come from France. Uh, I'm 18 years old and uh, I'm good at judo. Excellent, thank you very much, Gary. Okay, now, the next bit you have to help me with, because this is a bit where you have to provide the details. You have all been invited to a conference for gifted athletes somewhere hot and sunny. Now, if I was doing this with a class in, say, Greece, I'd say, away from Greece. And if you've taught in Greece, you'll never say, why? What's wrong with Greece? Why not? Why away from Greece? You know, that some students get very annoyed if you say, I say, Greece is wonderful, but we're going away just for this activity. Okay, but we're coming back after. You can see <laughs> more. So away from the UK, which isn't difficult to, if you're looking for somewhere hot and sunny. So somewhere hot and sunny, where is it taking place? I have no idea. Somebody tell me. Thank you. Are you British? No. Where are you from? No, really, really. United States. <laughs> okay. America, I'm married to an American. Americans are very good at this kind of stuff because they know that there's a kind of element in teaching where you, the, the, the teacher throws out a chance to say something. Most students in the situation, and frankly, some of you look as if you were waiting to find out what my right answer was. There's no right answer in this. I, have, I can't continue unless you give me the details because I don't know. He was very American. He went straight in there, and that's fantastic. And he said, Egypt, thank you. Now, and that, because you're, you're the best kid in the class, and you're really good at this kind of stuff, but I have to tell you, shut up now. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> and, and because we've known each other for a while now, you've been in my class a while, you know 
that you can't keep shouting out the answers. I'm so sorry, because I love your answers. Is that enough obsequiousness? You know, <laughs> so we know it's in Egypt, but where in Egypt? Where is it? I have no idea. Cairo. Cairo, thank you. This conference is taking place in Cairo, Egypt. Remember, it's for you. Oh, I didn't ask you to feel. How does it feel to be the best in your country at your sport? Just feel it. You wake up in the morning knowing that you are the best skier at your age in your country. How does that feel? It's good, isn't it? Well, it's, it's very motivating, very focusing. And you're not arrogant people. You don't walk down the street saying, hey, did you know I'm the best skier in my country? No, you don't do that. You, but you feel it inside. And I want you to feel it for the next few minutes. You are the best in your country at your sport. Cairo, Egypt, when is this conference taking place? Which month of the year? I don't know. April. April. Did I hear April? Thank you very much. That's your last answer. I'm awfully sorry. You're very good in this class. I love you, but you have no more answers. April. And how long is it? Do you really have to sit down? Are you not feeling very well? Okay. Do you want to go in another room then? <laughs> Are you got swine flu or anything? Oh. Okay. Good. <laughs> right. So it's it's sorry. Which of the month? April. 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 How long is it going to take place for? Three days. Is that all? All right. Three days. No, I heard three days first. Some of you are coming from miles away. For three days, I heard three days first. I accept what I hear first. And what's the start date? What? The date it starts. 14th of April, my dad's birthday. <laughs> it would have been 109 this year. Right. Okay, 8, 14th of April. Can you remember all that stuff, all right? So can you just remind me, because my memory is so useless. Where is this conference taking place? And when is it starting? 14th of April. And how long is it going to last? Three days. You're going to regret that three days. That's really <laughs> short, okay? Right, okay, so you're all flying in from your countries. Can you introduce yourself to five or six people with, hello, my name is, and I'm very good at this, okay? Just do that part, okay? <laughs> You're free at 6 o'clock. So in your new group of friends, can you make a plan to do something this evening? Let's meet at this time and do this. And remember, you're under 18, so no drinking, no bars. Sorry. <laughs> I've got your parents to think about. So you can't, you can't include drinking and bars. But make a plan to do something this evening with the people around you, okay? Let's do this tonight. <laughs> for the verb apologize. We always apologize a lot. What's the word we use? Apologize. No, what's the, the adverb we use? Apologize something link. Oh yes, but to apologize something link. Profusely. Profusely, thank you. 
In British English, in Australian English, in New Zealand English, in South African English, in Singaporean English, but not in American English, we say apologize profusely. But it's a collocation we never teach. Sorry, you'll see it on there. You'll see it on there in a minute. Don't worry. Okay, so the, the late people, I'm going to count to three, and then you must run on the spot for five seconds, and then you must apologize profusely. Three, two, one, start running. Five, four, three, two, one, apologize. Somebody over there said three days. You could have said a month. Right. So you're at the airport in Cairo. Now, this is an important point coming up. You're at the airport in Cairo, the international airport in Cairo. What is the name of the international airport in Cairo? Your students go, I don't know. Right? And shrivel up. I don't care what the real name is of the international airport in Cairo. But I want you to invent a name of the international airport in Cairo. What is the name of the international airport in Cairo? <laughs> Fantastic answer, Cairo International Airport. <laughs> Sometimes people come up with something else. You are at so remember, you've got these wonderful new friends. You may never meet them again. This could be goodbye forever. So say goodbye for the last time to your friends. Mm -hmm. Another world, okay? We can have another world in the classroom. 
So you apply for the grant, you get the grant, but you don't tell your friends from, where was the first one? I'm sorry, I forgot. Yeah. Egypt, Cairo. Because you don't want them to be envious, but you all get the grant. So the next time you meet is at the conference center in San Juan, San Juan, San Jose, San Jose. Uh, imagine, not seeing them for a year. What a surprise. Say hello to your old friend from Cairo. <laughs> Fantastic. So let's see what we just did there. These are the first, you can, you can take notes if you want, or you can email me. My email address is at the end, and you can get this as a Word document. I don't give handouts anymore because I'm trying to be green as well. Vegetarian food, no handouts. It's a greener world this year, okay? So you can make notes if you want, but you can also, if you want, get this as a Word document from me later. Look at the things that you did, and that you did. Students cho choose the name, nationality, and sporting ability, the location, the duration of the sporting exercise. And you see, I first saw an activity like this from an American teacher. She was a very good teacher, a wonderful teacher working in Spain. But she gave everybody in the class a piece of paper that said, you are Olga, you come from Russia, you go to volleyball, or something like that. But why? You know, and my key word today is improvisation. You improvise those things. You think, well, that's what I provide. Yes, it is. For a student working in that foreign language, the name, the nationality, the sport that you're good at, that's what I call improvisation. It's creative, it's imaginative, and it's safe. It's manageable. And for me, that's the key to any activity for it to work at any level. We always say that it's better and easier at higher levels. Even at higher levels, some students feel at sea because they haven't got a clear idea of what they're supposed to do. So those are what, that's what you did. There's the word profusely. Someone is 30 minutes late and apologizes profusely. You say goodbye at the airport, decide on the location of next year's conference. Next year's conference is taking place where? Have you forgotten already? Costa Rica, gracias. Mucho gracias. Para esta, and this bit of ayuda. Right, and write to the government meet on you. And then if you want some, people will say, but what do you do next? Frankly, I don't care what you do next. For me, in a classroom where most of the time is spent looking in a book, to do this for five minutes, sit down, open your book again, get on with it. I don't care if that's what you do. You see what I mean? You don't have to have a follow-up to all things. But people say, what's the follow-up? say, okay, the follow-up is you write what happened for homework. Easy. And it's a very interesting set of homework that you get back, I can tell you. you know, well, I met these people from all these different countries, and it was great, and we did this, and we did that. The funny, funny thing for me is walking around adults like you, listening to the um, apologies for being late. I walked past one just last week in Paris, and this woman said, I couldn't find a babysitter. I said, you're 14 years old. Went, oh, yeah, sorry. Um, <laughs> I seem to think of myself as a, as a parent. But that was quite fun. Okay, let's do something else. Can you please take out a piece of paper, a piece of A4 paper, you've got some in your file, so no excuses, and just write this on it. I want to, I want to, I want to. Divide your piece of paper into three sections, like this. Can you all see what I've done here? Okay. Okay. Divide your piece of paper into three You all have paper in your green file. Well, I had anyway. I did. I had. I did. I had paper. Did I? I had. I can't speak anything anymore. Have you done that? Okay. Have you all done this? Yes. At the back as well. I'm coming to the back to check. Right. Now, can you please complete these three sentences with three desires? Okay, I want to do something three times. Okay? 
It can be now, it can be in your life, it can be tomorrow, it doesn't matter what. There's three desires on your piece of paper. Can you write it in a line because you need the space underneath? You need the space. So leave a bit of space, okay? Just write it in a sentence like that. Leave the rest of it the space. Now, <clears throat> I should tell you, I organized this um, workshop with the room we had last year in mind, Itesh. So last year when we did this in June, July, we had a room in the, in the other uh, building which you could move around. So of course you can't move around too easy, but this is a mingler, okay? Have you all written your three desires? I'm not going to look at them, I promise. I don't mind if you've made spelling mistakes. I hope you haven't said anything rude, because um, with my students, I always try and say, look, I'm giving you the opportunity to be creative, but I'm not asking you to be rude as well, OK? So I, I might just walk around and just glance at the, the usual suspects who write something a bit provocative, right? I hope you've not written anything rude or sexually oriented. If you have, what do you have to do about it, OK? Now, the thing is, this is a mingler, but even where we can you all please stand up again? I know, oh, stand up. I wouldn't ask you both these activities on the same day. Now, you now have three desires, OK? Talk to the nearest, listen to the instructions first. Talk to the nearest person to you and say, I want to, and then give your desire. The person will reply to you, I'm afraid you can't. <laughs> Whatever the desire is, I'm afraid you can't. This activity is called, I'm afraid you can't. I didn't, and you must tell them, when you're doing this, don't tell your students that at the beginning, because it will direct what they're going to write down, OK? So you say to the first person, I want to, and they say, I'm afraid you can't. I say, why not? And they must give you a reason. And you take a little, I know it's a bit difficult, take a little, and make a little note of the reason. Then go to somebody else and go to your second one, and they'll give you, a, and they say, I'm afraid you can't. And ask why not to get the and, all, and also, of course, after you've given your desire, you listen to the person's desire back, and you say, I'm afraid you can't to them. Is that clear? Yes. Right? So, and, you, and they write down, so nobody's allowed to do anything, right? It's always, I'm afraid you can't. And then, oh, wait, hold on, hold on. So then you've got three. If you want to leave class, you with just one. But I think three is nice. So when you've spoken to three people, you've got a, a reason why they say you can't do it. You then speak to a fourth person, I want you to speak to everybody in the class, in fact, eventually, as you can imagine. You go back to the first one, and you say the same one again. You don't let them see what the original um, blocking was, and you say, I'm afraid you can't. Why not? If they give you the same reason, they say, sorry, I'm not accepting that. I've already got that. <laughs> so you see, they have, to, they have to find another reason why you can't do it. Is, is that clear, yes. more or less? So start, see how it goes. Talk to at least four people.
So let's see what we just did there, if my machine's working okay. Oh, I didn't do this first, sorry. I wanted us to think of a real classroom, I beg your pardon. Do you know this cartoonist? Do you know what his name is? Gary Larson, well done. Does anybody know what the boy in blue is saying? My head is full. Well done! Wow! Fantastic! How do you feel now? I feel something. Yeah! When some, you know, I've seen... Uh, the, well, the reason I did that is fantastic enough for him to remember that cartoon. Well, I'll tell you in a minute. We'll see. But, uh, but you know, I've seen people, teachers ask students things and they say, and they give an answer, which is amazingly creative and, and something from there. And she goes, hmm, and walks away. <laughs> Sorry, somebody that's been really good. They deserve to be given a big, big congratulations, you know? And I'll always never forget my German teacher gave us one day. He said, he said here's the end of a Hollywood film. Endstation Sehnsucht. Are you speaking up, Joe, to know what film that is? Endstation End station Sehnsucht. And I thought, Sehnsucht is like longing or something. Endstation, that's kind of terminus. And I have fortunately seen the, the movie, which, it, do you know what it is? No, you don't know there's a... Uh, Marlon Brando's in the movie. Yes! Well done, Streetcar Named His Heart. So when I said, is it Streetcar Named His Heart? My German teacher, who was a rather quiet man, he went, well done! Like that. <laughs> <laughs> and I just enjoy German forever after that. <laughs> well done. In fact, he's saying, Mr. Osborne, may I be excused? My brain is full. <laughs> and when you see it, yeah, that's funny. But it's actually a really, really crucial piece of information about the general classroom experience. Not just in, in learning English, but in learning most subjects. You know, so much time is spent listening to the teacher, and the teacher says, okay, I've finished talking, now open your books and start reading for the next 11 minutes, you know. And it's all this stuff going pouring in. And sometimes your brain is full, and that's why you need to do things like this. Now, I didn't ask this after the first activity. There will be some people in this room who felt uncomfortable about doing that sporting excellence activity. That's unfortunate. If you're in the teaching profession and you didn't like doing that, that's pretty unfortunate. But it, many, many students don't like that kind of stuff. I'd say many. There may be 10, 15, 20% maximum of your students don't actually like the inter interacting stuff. You know? But actually, that's not very good for their learning if they don't. So it's really nice to encourage the one to go, oh, no, the talks, I don't like pair work. Uh. <laughs> okay, I'll talk to him. You know? To encourage pair work in group work, get some of those students out of that awful place they are where they're not communicating with anybody else. And the English classroom is a very good place for it. So these activities are for this kind of moment when you think, Jesus, I've been talking to them for an awful long time. Let's do something a bit different. Get them on their feet, walk them around, that kind of thing. Well, this is what we just did. And remember, if you do this, don't say, this activity is called I'm afraid you can't when you start. That gives it a... No, really, these things are really important to get in the right order. Don't tell them what it's about until later. Because you must write down the three things first. I want to. If you only want to write down one thing because you think that's enough time, that's okay. Uh, it's a good mingler. It's, a, it's an organized, limited mingler. Uh, express one desire at a time to the students you meet. Block the desires you hear by saying, I'm afraid you can't. Make a note of the block reasons and refuse to accept the same one twice. Collate for homework. You know, Again, you just write down the things that you asked and the things that people said back to you. If you can do reported speech, as they say, I asked the class, I said I wanted to do this, and she said I couldn't because, you know, that's quite complicated. But just write, ask the elementary students, I want to go to the toilet, she said I'm afraid you can't, the toilet is closed. You know, whatever. It's as simple as that, and it works. Good. Now, as I say, 
I did a, a, a thing at the other branch 18 months ago when there were seats around. I was very much looking forward to doing my next activity, which <coughs> is called Doctors and Nurses, not the sort of doctor and nurse you play when you're a child. <laughs> and this is a story which I'm going to show you in a minute on the board. And basically, it's got a lot of words um, repeated. And what I do is I put people in six groups, and I give them these words. One that says patient or patients, nurse or nurses, doctor or doctors, said, sorry, and hospital. Thank you. So the groups in six, the, the classes in six groups, they have a word each. And I say, don't worry about the story, but when you hear your word, stand up and sit down very quickly. Okay. And it sounds ridiculous, and it's the most wonderful activity on the planet. Because I say, at the hospital, woo, the hospital people stand up, you know, near where I live. And I'll show you the story, because in fact, the improvisation, that's not improvisation. Standing up and sitting down is not improvisation. I tried, the, the reason why I'm not doing it here, because I walked into here and I thought, this reminds me of Novosi Beers. Has anybody been to Novosi Beers? I bet you haven't. Then you have. Have you been to Novosi Beers? You're Russian. You, but even so, you still need to know what it is. It's a long way. It's a four hours flight from Moscow, so it's a long, flight, long way to go. Novosibirsk is an amazing city. It's got its main central university, then another university out of town, which was built in the Soviet days for scientific excellence. It's full of very brainy people. And I did a talk there, and all these very brainy looking teachers were standing there. And I gave them in a lecture hall like this. And I gave, you know, doctors, nurses, blah, blah, blah. And I said, at the hospital now, and all the hospital people stopped, and then disappeared because their seats went dying. <laughs> 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 and these people struggling. With them. I said, shall we do something else? You know? Anyway, so I'll show you the story. Again, you can get this as, a, as an email attachment. But this is what the story says, basically. At the hospital near right, the, the improvisation bit is coming later. All the doctors are women and all the nurses are men. When new patients arrive at the hospital, they always call the doctors nurses. This is quite interesting. Right? All, the, all the doctors are actually women. That's the key line here, you see. But when you're doing it, when you're standing up and sitting down, you're not listening to the story at all. So this is later. Which makes the doctors feel quite annoyed. And they also call the nurses, the men, doctors, which makes the nurses feel quite pleased. One day at the hospital, a patient, a man, approached a doctor. Excuse me, nurse, said the patient. When can I see the doctor? <laughs> Listen, said the doctor. I'm a doctor, and the man over there that you think is a doctor is actually a student nurse. Can you imagine the doctor and the nurses during the... Um, said the doctor, I'm a doctor, and the man over there you think is a doctor is actually a student nurse. It's great, fantastic fun. And very rarely are there broken bones. It's okay. Oh, sorry! That's the first example of sorry, so the sorry people almost go through the roof with excitement. <laughs> said the patient, the last time I came to this hospital, that doctor, oh, sorry, that nurse, that nurse said that you were a nurse. Well, I'm not, said the doctor. I'm a doctor, not a nurse. But once again, sorry about that, said the patient. By the way, what's your name? Nurse, said the doctor. Doctor, that doctor. <laughs> Where's the problem? Never have a problem, the name. Now, this is the important part. This is the important part. <coughs> uh, course material is full of stuff like this, you know. Narrative um, stories written by course book writers like me at 2 o'clock in the morning, which seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> and the editor read it at 2 o'clock in the morning, and she thought it was a good idea as well. And eventually got published, you go, oh, Jesus, is that a good idea? <laughs> anyway, so, but you find your course material full of okay-ish narrative. Not authentic material, and even if it was, I'd still do this. So I say to the students, close your books now, okay? Frank, this is up. At the hospital near where I live. Where is the hospital? So they all look. I say, no, close your books. Isn't it in there? The answer is not in your book. The answer is in your mind. They go, I don't think it is. <laughs> I say, no, come on. The, it, imagine it was written. And I, I did this with a bunch of Hungarian 16 year olds. Anybody here from Hungary? Before I say something wonderful about that country. <laughs> <laughs> Hungary is, is the brainiest country on the planet, really. They, 10 million people, they've had 22 <coughs> Nobel Prize winners. They'd have had 50 Nobel Prizes if the other scientists had chosen to write their findings in English, not in Hungarian. There's nobody reads Hungarian. Maybe you understand a bit of Hungarian. They always say Finnish people understand a bit of Hungarian. But, well, that's what the Hungarians claim. Anyway, so, but it's very difficult getting Hungarians to do something they don't want to do. So I was faced with this bunch of 16 year olds. I said, Where is the hospital? And if you know anything about Hungarian languages, it starts very high. It's like, there, Chicago, it's getting sick, something like that. It starts high, finishes low, in English and in Hungarian. So they, hello, my name is Garo, so I come from Hungary. <laughs> <laughs> so I said to this class, where is the hospital? 
So they all looked down. They weren't looking down. It wasn't any of them. Actually, they had, it was a, it wasn't a course book, it was a piece of paper. I said, the answer is not on the piece of paper. Where is the hospital? This boy said, near where I live. I said, near where you live? No, near where you live. I said, isn't where I live. I know where it is. He said, I don't know where it is. I said, no, I don't know where it is. Either. And he said, classic line, if you don't know, how can I know? I said, look, the whole point is, none of us know. It doesn't say there, so we have to decide for ourselves. Okay, and I don't know where it is. Promise. And they went, I don't believe you. Well, that's the way most of the time they think you've got an idea and you're going to use the N word. They're going to say Boston and you're going to say no. Now, there's no room, there's no room for the N word, for my, in my opinion, anywhere in teaching, teaching any subject. You should never, never say no. Go back to my lovely uh, German teacher. If you did something right, you say, fantastic, well done. I come from Manchester, in case you didn't notice. She's got a very strong Manchester accent of mine. Fantastic, well done, fantastic. And if you made a mistake, you say, well done, try again. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm wrong, right? It was nice. You always said, fantastic, you made a mistake. And I've never, never forgotten that. And the word no is a terrible word to use. But in this situation, I don't know where the hospital is. I said, look, let's imagine it's in an English-speaking country somewhere. So where's the hospital? Where is the hospital? Where? I don't know where it is, honestly. I don't know where, it is. where is it? Delhi. Delhi. Who said that? Did you say Delhi? Yeah. Delhi, in India. Yeah. OK, good. The hospital is in Delhi, in India. Now we know where we are. Can then we tell me how old this building is, the hospital? How old is it? 100 years old. 100 years old? Blimey, OK. Right. So, so what year was it built? A bit of mathematics. 18. 18. Wait, two, I mean, what, what year? Should we start? What year is it? 2009. 1909. Can somebody tell me how many floors there are in this hospital in Delhi? 10 in 1909. Okay. <laughs> it was a very modern building in 1909 in Delhi. 10, 10 floors. How many beds are there in the hospital? Sorry? <laughs> 200 beds. 10 floors, 200 beds. How many beds per floor is that? 20 beds per floor. How many uh, doctors in the hospital? 23. 23. Only three. I heard 20, but she's already answered. Three doctors. How many nurses? None. None at all. This is a great story. And it's a great story you would never see in a book, is it? You know, there's a hospital in Delhi. It was built in 1909. 10 floors with three hospitals, three doctors, and no nurses. But this is great. Oh, by the way, I forgot to say, you must be taking notes for this, because this is your homework to write the bigger story, you see. Now, so we now know that some guy came into the hospital, says it's a man, <clears throat> but we don't know anything about him. Can I have a name for this man, please? Robert, thank you. Why are you looking so worried? You can say, you can say anything you want, and it will be the right answer. You know, you can say rhubarb, and I'll say, yes, his name is rhubarb. There's, do you see what the point is here? You've got to, you get away from all those fears of making mistakes in a situation like this. And you, the teacher, must understand that as well. You don't go, mm, no. <laughs> Except, Robert, what's his family name? What's his family name? Rossi. Pardon? Rossi. <laughs> I was like, I've done this with so many groups of 16-year-olds or 14-year-olds. I say, he's really, really old. Look how you use directs, but he's really old. How old is he? And this time, he said, 30. <laughs> I said, he's really old. 32? <laughs> because if you're 16, so a little experiment here. I'd like you all, you don't have to tell me how old you are. I just want you to double your age. Imagine meeting somebody of that age, okay, is that person old? Hmm, I think he is, is he? So a 16 year old, 32 is very old. So no, no, he's immensely old, older than your great grandparents ago, blimey. Okay, so he's eventually, he's about 90 years old. So the, and, now, and now a serious point here, serious point here, because this Robert, Robert Rossi has come to the hospital in Delhi as well. <laughs> this man of Italian origin, this is a really interesting story, isn't it? It's actually a very much more interesting story than we would ever write in the book. You say, what's wrong with him? You want, he's got to have three things, but nothing horrible. You have to make some limits about the amount of... Because I, I tell you, once you start doing this kind of thing with your students, and they know 
that you never say no as an answer. They'll say anything, and they'll say some pretty awful stuff unless you put the lid on it a bit. Nothing horrible. What's wrong with him? He's 90 years old. Diarrhea. Diarrhea. <laughs> <laughs> okay? It's <laughs> not horrible, but he's not, he's, not, he's not horrible in the sense I'm meant to. <laughs> this is the part where you go, diarrhea, very good. <laughs> Actually, it's not very good, you know. This is, this is an interesting, I should tell you this, because this is an interesting moment when you actually find people saying, you know, he's got diarrhea. He's got diarrhea, very good. And you realise that you shouldn't really say that when somebody says they've got diarrhea, you know? You go, What's my name? I've got that. Oh, very good. <laughs> it reminds me of when I was teacher training at International House years and years ago. And when we had a new group of teacher trainees, we'd say to the first one, just stand up with the guinea pig students, just ask them their names and where they're from, and then sit down. That's all you have to do is your first teacher practice. And this guy, he was so nervous, Simon. He said, Hello, I'm Simon. You can see perspiration flying off him. She was going, Relax, it's okay, you know. It's only your first day, you'll be okay by next week. You see the students almost willing him to be relaxed. And there's this beautiful African guy sitting on one side, very tall, elegant man. And he said, what's your name? And the guy said, Mohammed. He said, very good. And Mohammed thought, hmm, okay, thank you. <laughs> he said, where are you from? He said, Somalia. He said, very good. Yeah. It's not actually, that's why I'm here. <laughs> so there, there are points where you mustn't say very good like that. Okay? He said, and then he got <laughs> Got so enthusiastic. Why are you here, Mohammed? Thinking, I've come here to learn English would be his answer. He said, Rafuji. <laughs> Sorry? He said, Rafuji. He answered, What's he saying? <laughs> He's a refugee. <laughs> oh, refugee! <laughs> try again, try again. Refugee. <laughs> refugee. Very good. <laughs> so occasionally you don't say very good. Anyway, so back to, back to our man. I've forgotten his name already. What's his name? Roberto <laughs> Rossi in this hospital in Delhi. Remind me where the hospital was built. <laughs> How many beds has he got? 200. Okay. So then, and then, so we need two more things wrong with Roberto Rossi. He's got diarrhea. Anything else? He's limping. He's limping. <laughs> <laughs> That's a bad combination. <laughs> He's limping. He's got a limp. Very good in my elementary class, and I'm going to Another serious point, another serious point. This is only an elementary class, and she says, he's limping. And I said, very good. And the students say, what? Because they didn't understand the word. And they look at me, right? Because that's what students do. Whatever a student says in the class, they look at the teacher for confirmation. And unfortunately, most of us enjoy that. We like people going, what? Oh, help, do it, tell me. And we shouldn't help them. She's the one who knows. And they go, huh? She knows the answer. So they turn, and because uh, I'm, again, used to working with monolingual classes, they will then turn to her and say something in Hungarian or Polish or whatever their local language is. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with doing that. They ask her in their local language, what did you just say? And she tells them, live, and translates it for them. There's nothing wrong with, hmm? Can I say it in my language? See, si, si so, so, <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> I went to an NLP workshop once. We're going to, well, I want somebody who can't spell. Who can't spell? And a, an Austrian woman actually. I'm not very good at spelling. So the, 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 have you ever been to a neuro linguistic programming workshop? It, it's, it's great sometimes. Anyway, so this woman sitting there. She's right. Now let's find a really difficult word for Andrea to spell. Anybody got a, a word that you have a problem with? This woman said, I always have a problem with diarrhea. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got to spell diarrhea. Anyway, sorry, I'm going back. <coughs> Where's the improvisation? So we now, uh, when we get to the end of the, of the, uh, the story, we have a whole bunch of information about the hospital, about the man, about the doctor. We find something nice to say about the doctor and the nurse. One doctor, of course, who's a woman, one nurse who's a man, and Richard uh, Robert Rossi. Okay, and then I put the students into threes, basically. It's simple as that. The improvisation comes out of all that information you now have generated together that is another key. Don't keep giving people a bit of paper saying you're Roberto Rossi, you've got diarrhea, you know, you wouldn't do that anyway. <laughs> Don't give people the information. Let them find it for themselves. Put them in threes and say, come up with a little, little conversation between yourself. You've got so much backstory there, okay? So that's how that works. Right, what's next? What am I doing next? And what's, ah, my God, how much longer? I haven't got very much longer. You've got, no, you've got uh, about five minutes or something. Five minutes. Yeah. Should I do the Pechukucha? Yeah.
Yes. Okay, I'm going to go through the... Uh, oh, all right, well, no, what, this, is, this is basically some... Most, most of the rest of it is... I'll go through the notes that I was writing, because, you know, what have we made of these activities? <coughs> um, so what did I write in the abstract, what I've written here? This is what I wrote in the abstract, if you... Uh, saw that. Anyone familiar with improvised theatre and comedy may think that improvisation is inappropriate for their students. How can students who often struggle to put together the simplest sentences be expected to improvise? And I hope that these activities show you that you can find a way, a limited, focused, carefully organised way, that the students can actually say something different and unusual and, and imaginative, even elementary students. So these are just some thoughts. Again, you can get this as a Word document at the end. <coughs> so, and this is a key for me. Some teachers spend, a lot of us have to spend most of their time following the course book and preparing for exams or tests. This is the unwritten reality behind most uh, people like me come and saying, do this in your teaching. Most people are following a book or preparing for an exam. That is really 80 or 90% of the reality of most, certainly of most non native speaker teachers teaching in their own country. <coughs> And I think that this means that you become lecturers and providers of information, and you become the students are passively involved with the lesson. This is my constant feeling that you, know, you can't avoid that. You have to be giving information, either verbally or asking people to read things. So what can we do about it? We want activities that are quick to set up and fun to do and don't take up much time. Very, very, very important and crucial. Quick, fun, and not much time. If, if, you, know, you can spend more, if you've got more time, spend more time. You know, I, when I had classes at International I had 10 hours a week with the same students. That is just not a real circumstance. I mean, you guys work in the UK. Maybe you have that sort of situation. Most people in the world don't have that. <coughs> okay. And this is important, too. <coughs> in terms of trying to remember... You see, you're probably... Those of you who are language teachers that tend to have been good language learners as well, you see. But the fact is, when people walk into your classroom... They know exactly where they are in the kind of pecking order of um, the people in the class. Do you know what I mean? You walk in, he's the best in the class, she's absolutely hopeless, but all those other people, and I'm kind of there, you know. And a lot of them, so the ones at the bottom of it, they walk in and say, this is, I'm going to be another nightmare. And they love you sometimes, and they really don't want to disappoint you. This is the key. They love you to bits, they don't want to disappoint you. And if, if they're, you know, they can't do all this grammar stuff. But they may be the ones who come up with the really funny answers to the questions about either from the, the um, sporting excellence activity or looking at the reading text and finding the extra details. They can have other skills and also things like we can't talk about, our singing and miming and drawing. Okay? And they may be very quick-witted. You know, the person who says, no nurses in the class like that might be the person in the class who's never said anything. It's very funny. A an image of a hospital with no nurses is a very strong image. It took very little language to say that. And suddenly, he, who's normally at the bottom of the class, is the kid who's come up with a brilliant answer. And it makes a difference the way they feel about the class. I've not got time to talk about these people. <laughs> right, because that's what I wanted to focus on. The wonderful Albert Einstein. Even Albert Einstein, because as we all know, he failed exams to get into the first college he applied to. He understands what I mean when I... Well, I understand what he means. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> this is the key of what I've just been talking about. That when you walk into the classroom, apart from that pecking order of how good you are at English, there should be another one. You know, Joe's completely used to never does his homework. Boy, does he say some funny things when he gets the chance, okay? So, that's that last bit. This is me. That's my book, which all these are from. You can have a look at it in a minute. Ah, uh, 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 and this is my blog, right? Oh. If you want to follow, th there's my blog uh, address. Because I put a lot of... Um, a lot of uh, improvisation activities on my blog, and I relate them to things like the Comedy Store, if anybody's been to the Comedy Store in London. So that's the title of the blog, kenwilsonelt.wordpress.com. That's what it looks like. And here's an... Uh, yeah, are we going to do this? Are we going to type? Okay. Does anybody here know what Pecha Kucha is? I'll come back to that in a minute, because also on my blog, apart from things to do with language, I've got a little, as, as um, uh, Nick very kindly said a bit late, a bit earlier, when you go to my blog, there's a whole bunch of sketches and songs you can download for free. For free. These are things that I published a long time ago. They're now out of print, and I want to give them away. You know, when a book goes out of print, nobody ever sees it anymore. So I've taken the sketches out of the book, 
language school sketch is hilarious. Okay, so that, what would you do? The WMA ones are songs, so you get the song and a worksheet. Lots of that stuff. Just go to the, the website, the blog site, and click on box.net. It's free. Okay. Uh, if you're not on Twitter, you should be, if you're involved in language teaching. Get on Twitter. Who's on Twitter already? Not enough people. If you're involved in education, you should be on Twitter. There's some great, great groups of teachers of all languages working on Twitter. There's a fantastic ELT community up there sharing ideas with them or just sharing observations about life. If you know who Scott Thornbury is or Jeremy Harmer or Nick Bilbrow or Ken Wilson, are you on Twitter? No. You should be. You should be on Twitter, mate. You should get them out fast. Because it's, it's full of people. You know, you, can, you know, Scott Thornbury every day tells you what he's having for lunch. Yeah. <laughs> which, is, which is a good side of Twitter. a picture of it as well, isn't it? He takes photographs of, of his lunch and puts them on. <laughs> which is the kind of silly side of Twitter. But this also makes Scott into a real human being. He's a very, very funny guy when he's not talking about language. <laughs> but also, a lot, of, a lot of the... No, no, he's also a funny guy when he's talking about language. He's, he's a very funny guy. <laughs> Right, we'll get on Twitter. Nick's, Nick's um, uh, ID is at Nick Bilbra, isn't it? That's, that's your, yeah. your, uh, your Twitter address, is at yeah. Nick Bilbra. Mine is at Ken Wilson London. You should have an ass at the beginning to find it. But go, and, and, oh, right, here's my email address. If you want this stuff as a, as a <laughs> Word document, the activities and those thoughts at the end, and the images, I'll put the images, the, the cartoon from um, uh, Gary Larson, okay, that I showed you before. So, quickly, Ken writes at btinternet.com. Get that written down because you won't get another chance because we're going back to this one. Oh, I'll give you another little moment to write that down. Because I can't resist doing... Would you, would you, Nick, could you kind of um, get rid of this and put the other one up while, while, I'm, while I'm standing here and explaining? Because it, it, you'll find it's, it's actually down there somewhere. Okay, so just, just to make, before you do that, Okay, does anybody here know what Pachakucha is? Okay, right. A quick explanation. Because I feel, having just done this, that there is a, a place for this in the classroom if you have the technology. Pachakucha, as we're calling it these days. Anybody hear Japanese or speak Japanese? Right, so Pachakucha, does it mean uh, chitter chatter? Right. Do you know what it's about, this Pachakucha? Yes, it is. Of course it is. That's his Indian chit chat. But, but the pecha kucha, pecha kucha, as English people for some stupid reason say, it, okay, is as follows. You have, uh, you have to do a presentation that consists of 20 PowerPoint slides. Each slide only stays up for 20 seconds. And it auto advances, as they say. You have no control. When we start this, when we start this, I will have no control over the movement of the, the um, slides. So I have six minutes and, 20, and 40 seconds. You will know that my presentation from now on will last for six minutes and 40 seconds. And in those six minutes and 40 seconds, I'm gonna try and find things to say that are the right length to fit in with the slides. Does that make sense? Yes. And I did it for the first time last Saturday night in Paris at the TESOL Paris conference. I was as nervous as a nervous thing on nervous day. I was so nervous about it. And I thought at the last minute, can I actually say I don't want to do this? You know, can I get out of this? And sitting next to me was a Turkish woman who's also one of the ELT's best known non-native speaker bloggers. Her name is Burcu Akyol. Um, you can also follow her on Twitter. And, you can, and her blog is brilliant from the point of view of a non-native speaker teacher. She was sitting next to me. She was doing her first pitch kucha. And she was the only non-native speaker. So I thought, if she can do it, I can do it. So I did it. And I'm going to try and do it again. <clears throat> and it involves me speaking lots of different languages, so I've got a cheat card here. Um, let me just see if I'm the right order. Okay, ready? I'm ready. I'm going to do six minutes and 40 seconds. I only have 20 seconds per slide. Okay, here we go. No, that's just mine. The other one. There's, there's another one down the bottom, I should say. Oh, right. <laughs> that, was, that was so brilliant and <laughs> Okay. Uh, Ta -da! Which no, one is it then? It's just down the Got it. You got it. Okay. Right, and then, so hit the, hit the start show. button. Ready? Ladies and gentlemen, tonight I want to talk about the beauty and variety of language. And I've used this image to show you what I'm talking about. This is the Tower of Babel. And it was built, as some of you may know, by the Babylonians because they wanted to build a tower so tall it would go through the clouds and reach the sky. The kind of thing you see in Dubai all the time, okay? But this man, actually that's Thor, but I'm using him for God. God was not happy. He said, Oi, Babylonians, what are you up to? 
because God is from the east end of London. <laughs> I'm not happy. So from now on, you will not speak one language. You'll see, speak lots of languages. As I say, thank God for God, because now we have a multiplicity of wonderful languages, and I'm going to speak seven of them now. You will see which language from the image. Which language should I speak first? <clears throat> good, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ken Wilson. I live in London, and I'm extremely happy to be here at the Drama Day in SOAS, November the 13th, 2009. Which language should I speak next? Tell me. Come on, tell me what I'm... Bonjour, mesdames et messieurs, je m'appelle Ken Wilson, j'habite à Londres, et je suis ravi, that's a very good word in French, actually, ravi, very happy, oh, sorry, uh, ravi d'être ici à l'école de, de, de études uh, africaines orientales. Oh, which one next? What language should I speak next? Spanish. Shout out, right. Uh, buenos dias, uh, señores y señoras, me llamo Ken Wilson, vivo en Londres, Y estoy muy contento de estar aquí en la escuela de estudios africanos orientales, más o menos, no, no sé exactamente. Okay. Which language do I speak next? Come on, tell me. I don't know which language I speak next. Help! Thank you. Deutsch. Guten Abend, meine Damen und Herren, und willkommen an Bord dieser Lufthansa Flug nach London. That's the only German I know. No, really, ich heiße Ken Wilson und ich uh, freue mich sehr here and so as uh, Tautsunemen. Is that good enough? Right, what's the next one? Oh, Italiano. Salve, buonasera. No, buonasera, buongiorno a tutti. Mi chiamo Kemus, abito a Londra e sono molto contento di essere qui a Soaz in novembre del 13. I don't know, I can't speak that time. What's the next one? Please help, help, change. I don't know what you are next. Oh, I can only speak Portuguese with a Brazilian accent. Um, Oh, I've lost it. Hold on. Um, <laughs> my name is Ken Wilson. I live in Londres. I am very happy to be here. Obrigado. <laughs> so finally, ah oh, no, the Japanese people they call it you are. What is you are Ken Wilson? Des Rondon Karakamashita. Rondon. 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 Rondon Karakamashita. Arigato gozaimasu. Right, so those are, the seven those are the seven languages, but what's the point? I want to say the problem I see now is that people from the English-speaking world don't learn enough languages. I mean, look at this. This is outrageous. I want you to speak English or get out. Look at that. You have reached the U.S. immigration hotline. Press 1 if you speak English. Press 2 to disconnect. Is that outrageous? Who do we blame for this? I blame this man. Not that man, the next man. Him. I blame Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill, who famously said, you don't have to speak, I can't do a Winston Churchill quotation. You don't have to speak a foreign language, you just have to speak English slowly and loud, and people will understand you. <laughs> he said that, he said that. And in fact, he could speak French. He was interviewed on French radio about his past. They said, did you know you were going to be a great man? He said, well, my past is divided into two parts. He, he talked about his past life. He said, quand je regarde mon derrière, je vois que c'est divisé en deux parties. <laughs> as a result, people in the English-speaking world don't learn foreign languages. And this is a disgrace. And the, the worst thing of all is that we go, English-speaking people go around the world, and there are always signs for us in English, because they know that the English will never learn languages, or the English-speaking peoples in general. And we just laugh at the signs. This is so unfair. We should be grateful for what people write. We should be grateful when we see signs like this one. I mean, what's wrong with that? <laughs> you see, you're laughing. You go there. Somebody is trying to be helpful, trying to show that they speak your language and they want to take your money away from you. I found a lot of the strangest signs are outside toilets. Can I have the toilet picture now? Toilets, please. Can I see the toilets? Thank you. Look at that one. Female. <laughs> no restroom. <laughs> And look at the man on the third sign there. His head is a marijuana leaf, okay? He's lost his mind to marijuana. He needs to go to the toilet. Women kingdom, I rather like him. And this one's in Moscow. You can only go in there if you have a shipping boat. <laughs> we shouldn't laugh. We shouldn't laugh. We shouldn't. This is a genuine sign in, in Japan. Which, where they were building a building. That's what it means. It's an erection. But now, unfortunately, people think if you go to Japan, you will see some very strange pictures. Okay? I love this one. I love this one. It's outside a temple. Those who are not allowed to enter the temple are, look at number five, 
Devotees getting impure due to death. <laughs> and number six, mad ladies and gentlemen. You go there, you have to have a piece of paper saying, look, I've been discharged from the local mental hospital. I'm okay. And, but when they come to England, these people, they see signs like this. Caution, pedestrians, slippery when wet. Well, of course they are. <laughs> Please do not throw stones at this sign. What is that sign? this one? Warning. Children lack on the tenant will be sold to the circus. <laughs> this is just terrible. This, this is what foreign visitors to our country have to put up with. And finally, in Canada, I saw this house in a forest. Are you wearing clean underwear? <laughs> we know the Canadians are very funny about hygiene, but that's ridiculous. But my friend said, Ken, there may be bears in the forest. Yeah, that's why. So finally, finally, got to the end, I want to say thank you for language. Thank you in many different languages, in fact. So the next one you'll see, can we all send it again? That's Arabic, Shakran. And the next one, merci, all together, and thank you. Obrigado, gracias, that's Mandarin Chinese, she she. Arigato, is that Masu, is it Chinese, is that Japanese? And grazie. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is Petra Kucha. Thank you very much indeed.